Perfect. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Aging Mind Foundation Lecture Series. We're pleased to have Belmont Village as our presenting sponsor. And um, today, I want to introduce Rebecca Reagan. She's going to be our moderator of the lecture today, and she's sitting next to me. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over. We have um, two great uh, videos today, one from um, Laurie Hulshaw, who is the founder of the Aging Mind Foundation, and also from Mercedes Carr, who is the president of Belmont Village Senior Living. And then, of course, our speaker today is Dr. Stephen Strittmatter. He is the director of Yale University Neurodegenerative Cellular Neuroscience School of Medicine. Did I get that right, Stephen? It is quite a mouthful. Pretty, pretty <laughs> close. <laughs> okay. Well, we're so thrilled to have you here today. And so we're going to um, do a couple presentations, and then Stephen will get started on the lecture that we've all been waiting for. And then Rebecca will be our moderator today. As you all ask questions, she will be giving them to Stephen. So thank you all very much for attending our lecture today. The Q&A function is at the bottom of the screen next to the raise hand button. It's the Q&A, so feel free to drop any questions throughout the presentation and we'll get to them right after. Hello everyone, I'm Mercedes Kerr, president of Belmont Village Senior Living. I'm pleased to introduce this installment of the Alzheimer's Research Webinar Series with the Aging Mind Foundation. For almost 25 years, Belmont Village has been home to so many interesting, accomplished, and beloved residents many of whom suffer from dementia or Alzheimer's disease. We strive to create purposeful, engaging, and joyous experiences for each of them and know that our evidence-based therapeutic programs help them to live better, wellness-inspired lives. We're always learning and continuously innovating to serve our residents' needs, so I look forward to this series. But before I turn it over to our speaker, I want to reiterate Belmont Village's commitment to those who are navigating this complex and difficult condition and to remind you that we're always here to help. I hope you enjoy today's discussion. Hello everyone and welcome to the Aging Mind Foundation Lecture Series presented by Belmont Village Senior Living. I'm Laurie Holshaw and as the founder of the Aging Mind Foundation, I'm pleased to have you join us today. The Aging Mind Foundation's sole purpose is to fund research aimed at identifying the cause of Alzheimer's and the dementias. Since 2014, our generous supporters have enabled us to award over $4 million in research grants to the top minds in neuroscience. Four of the most preeminent experts in their respective fields will be presenting each of our lectures this year. In addition to today's lecture, we'll show a short video on the research we funded. The entire program will be recorded and on our website for you to review and share with someone important in your life or for reference. It's my great privilege to introduce today's presenter, Dr. Stephen Strittmatter, Director of Yale University School of Medicine's Cellular Neuroscience, Neurodegeneration, and Repair Program. Today, Steve will communicate the latest advancements of his research, followed by a brief question and answer period. Please submit your questions via Zoom and we will give them to Dr. Strittmatter in the time allowed. In the meantime, the Aging Mind Foundation thanks you for being with us today. We hope you enjoy the lecture. All right, and I will hand it over to you, Dr. Strittmatter. Okay. Well, thanks for the opportunity to speak to everyone and uh, for the ongoing support we've had from the Aging Mind Foundation in particular. My talk today is gonna to be about synapses and the neural network in Alzheimer's disease. I should say as a disclosure that in addition to working at Yale, I'm the founder of a couple of biotech companies, one of which uh, is developing drugs in the Alzheimer's space. Okay. 
So uh, this is something uh, I want to start with, the need for progress in research for Alzheimer's disease. We need new therapies, better therapies. Uh, I think this is something probably everyone who's listening uh, is already attuned to, but I want to reemphasize a few points. And this is really a summary from the Alzheimer's Association. Today, there's something on the order of 6 million people in the US living with Alzheimer's disease. And of course, there are affected family members uh, as well. Um, these are some statistics. There's a new person diagnosed with Alzheimer's every seven seconds. The cost of caring for people with Alzheimer's disease is very large in a monetary sense. Of course, it's enormous in a personal, emotional, and psychological sense. But even from the monetary point of view, this is a large burden for the country. These two numbers here, uh, 350 billion is the direct medical care cost, but due to lost wages, family assistance, et cetera, the true cost, cost is closer to 600 billion per year. And another point is that while we're making progress with a lot of diseases in medicine, Alzheimer's, we still don't have uh, effective treatments for, uh, and it's a growing cause of death. And that's shown in the graph on the right. And the projections are because in part of the aging population that this number, 6 million, will more than double by 2015. So it's a growing problem. Where are we today? Uh, there are medications approved, which are provide slight symptomatic benefit. And many of you may know of these already, such as acetylcholinesterase inhibitors and memantine. But there's still no cure for Alzheimer's. Just yesterday, the, the landscape changed a bit. There is now um, one approved disease-modifying therapy. It's certainly um, limited in its impact, uh, and we don't have a solution for Alzheimer's yet, but maybe we're finally moving in the right direction, although many trials have failed. I think uh, a key thing is that beyond amyloid, which this new um, Adjahelm um, antibody targets, we need to discover additional new targets for drug therapy and to develop new drugs. And I'll try to get towards that direction as we talk today. Here's a little bit of background on Alzheimer's uh, before we get to the, the meat of the talk. Um, this shows uh, a cross section of the brain of an individual who's, or two individuals who've come to autopsy. Uh, a healthy brain is much larger than end stage severe Alzheimer's disease. So there's really a global damage to the brain. Although it's uh, worse in areas of the hippocampus and parts of the cerebral cortex, and overall shrinkage of the brain. But if we look under the microscope at what's happening in this brain with Alzheimer's disease, there's a few key factors uh, that are required really for the diagnosis, identified more than 100 years ago initially. These amyloid plaques in the brain. So these are these, I should orient you here, this is a section of brain tissue. Each of these small uh, circles with a dot in it, that's a healthy nerve cell in the brain. These two large balls here, those are amyloid plaques. The major constituent of this, the, and they're, they're not found in healthy, normal brain at all. Um, they do occur slightly with normal aging, but in Alzheimer's disease, there's many more of these, and that's really the sine qua non of the pathologic diagnosis. The other thing that's shown here is, I uh, said this is a healthy neuron. These neurons that are very dark shown here um, are filled up with a second part of the pathology called the neurofibrillary tangle. And the major constituent of that is a protein called tau. So there's two major pathologies, these amyloid beta plaques, which are larger than a cell, and this intracellular neurofibrillary tangle composed of tau. 
those are the two uh, main pathologic constituents associated with this shrinking of the brain. What's actually going wrong with the neurons? That was a, a piece of tissue which was stained to show these two um, pathologic abnormalities. But a key thing is why does the accumulation of plaque and tangles actually cause the brain to not work normally? And so we have to think a little bit about how the brain works uh, when it's healthy. Uh, this shows a nerve cell. Uh, it's a cartoon from the NIA, the National Institutes on Aging. Um, and you see a healthy cell here. It sends out a whole bunch of um, long, thin connections to other nerve cells, both axons and dendrites. And then importantly, these long extensions connect to other nerve cells. And what happens is electrical impulses will start in one cell, go down the long axon. When they reach the tip of that axon, one cell ends and a chemical, a neurotransmitter is released onto the second cell. This connection from one cell to the next is necessary to have a neural network that can carry out cognition, computation, memory, et cetera. Um, and this connection here uh, that's shown on the right-hand side is called a synapse. So all these nerve cells in the brain need to be connected one to another with synapses. Each nerve cell can make up to a thousand or more synapses on other nerve cells. That's how we get a very dense neural network that can support all the amazing things that the human brain can do. Well, then what happens in Alzheimer's disease? So this is another view, uh, a cartoon view of what I showed you in that actual tissue section in the last slide. These large balls here, which are outside of the cells, are the amyloid plaques. And inside of the neurons are these neurofilary tangles shown in the light blue. But what you can see is maybe instead of a bunch of these white dots where this cell is connecting through synapses with other cells, there's very few of these synapses. So even when there's some brain cells surviving, they're not connected well to other brain cells. Synapses are lost and the neural network fails, which is why uh, symptoms occur. So how does this happen? How is this amyloid and tau, this pathology connected to this loss of synapses? Well, there's lots of uh, data that the amyloid beta that accumulates in the plaque actually triggers the loss of synapses, that it's causative. It's not just there, but it has a causative role. This is the so-called amyloid hypothesis. And I won't go through all of that, uh, the data that support that idea. One piece is the fact that it's the major pathology when we look in the microscope. Another is genetics. There are rare cases of Alzheimer's which are inherited one-to-one -one from parent to child um, and usually cause early onset Alzheimer's disease. That's a rare subset of all Alzheimer's disease. But those people, those families have mutations in the genes that either encode amyloid beta or the enzymes that produce the short peptide that accumulates. And then probably uh, a lot of the recent data has focused on biomarkers, that is measurements of uh, chemistries or other um, assays from people with Alzheimer's and as they develop Alzheimer's. And a summary of that data that's developed over the last decade or so is shown here. What's shown on the, across the bottom is time, so people progressing from a pre-symptomatic state to mild cognitive impairment and then dementia. And what's shown in these different curves here are the different things that can be detected um, with medical measurements. And the first thing that happens is that amyloid beta starts accumulating. And that can detect, be detected either in the CSF, cerebrospinal fluid, or uh, by a PET scan, an imaging study. And I'll show you a picture of that in a second. 
this period here where a beta is accumulating and really reaches a maximum is on the order of 10 to 15 years. So people have no symptoms, but amyloid is piling up in the brain as people are 50, 60, 65. And then um, at this stage, this piling up of a beta causes both tau pathology, um, what I showed you before, as well as this synapse loss. And as synapses are lost, now cognition becomes impaired during mild cognitive impairment. We call it dementia when it's bad enough that people cannot carry out activities of daily living the way they used to. So that's the overall progression. Maybe um, a key thing to make is most of the trials that have gone on over the last 10 to 15 years have focused on amyloid itself. And one of the challenges and why many have failed, although um, there's some data that at least one of them has a marginal benefit, is that the amyloid piles up really early, long before people have symptoms, and it's actually at a maximum by the time symptoms occur. And so what I'm gonna spend the rest of the time uh, really focusing on is even when there's amyloid in the brain, what can we do to protect these synapses, which are really key to the neural network and the function of the brain? The amyloid itself might not matter if we could actually preserve the synapses in the face of amyloid. That's what the rest of the talk is about. I told you I would show you what some of these things look like. This is a picture, one of these PET scans that shows amyloid buildup in the brain. The, whoops, the cool colors, the blue means very low level of amyloid binding. So this is a radioactive compound that binds to amyloid in the brain. And a healthy person, there's very little binding. In a person with Alzheimer's who has all those plaques in the brain, this chemical when injected into the blood will stick to the brain and give a radioactive signal that can be picked up um, with imaging. So it's very easy to tell whether someone has amyloid in the brain by this kind of technology. It can also be tested uh, in the cerebrospinal fluid by a chemical assay if a lumbar puncture is done. Similarly, there's um, different chemicals that will bind to the accumulated tau. That's called tau pet. In addition, one can track synapses in the brain. This can be done indirectly because most of this, these synapses uh, use glucose to drive the activity, the connections between neurons. One can use a fluorodeoxyglucose, FDG, to look at the use of glucose. And what's shown where these arrows are is that compared to a healthy brain where there's these hot colors show lots of glucose utilization in the brain. In the brain of an individual with Alzheimer's, you can see that these posterior parietal regions have greatly reduced glucose utilization because Alzheimer's is specifically affecting those areas. It can also be detected now with a more direct measurement that directly, a drug that directly binds to synapses, uh, SB2A PET. I wanna make one uh, sort of last introductory um, remark about Alzheimer's because the the meaning and the diagnosis, the term Alzheimer's has changed a bit over the last 15 years. Um, going back a period of time, Alzheimer's really depended on the clinical diagnosis of dementia, that is the loss of function, and was confirmed at autopsy. And then beginning about 10 years ago, that definition was broadened to recognize people who have only mild cognitive impairment can be detected by a, a test um, in the clinic, um, but they are still able to carry out their activities of daily living if that was connected with evidence of a beta or tau by one of these tests that I just showed you. And then most recently, at least for research purposes, the National Institutes on Aging has recognized an asymptomatic Alzheimer's. So with no symptoms at all, if there's evidence of a beta and tau, this is classified at least for research purposes 
as Alzheimer's disease. And some trials have tried to target asymptomatic disease. Okay, now what about these synapses and how they're lost? What do we know and how can we intervene? So this is a, a drawing which shows uh, these accumulated proteins that I talked about before, amyloid beta and tau. This is a big plaque. Uh, this, these are smaller accumulations. These are present, as I've told you, in the Alzheimer's brain. In blue here is one of these thin threads of a nerve cell, and each of the little balls that extends from it is one of those synapses. These amyloid misfolded uh, accumulations of peptide target this synapse for loss. In addition, the immune cells in the brain, the so-called microglia, respond to these large balls and they release additional molecules which also target synapses. So if we zoom in on what's happening right there at this synapse and think about the molecules, this is a pathway that we've mapped out over the last 10 years or so here at Yale these misfolded proteins interact with a molecule called prion protein at the synapse that signals to another molecule called mGluR5 or metabotropic glutamate receptor 5. This, these interactions of a beta misfolded protein with uh, this complex triggers changes in the biochemistry of the neuron, including several enzymes which alter neurotransmitter receptors. They also recruit these innate immune mediators to the synapse. And the net result of all this biochemical activity is that the synapse is lost. And of course, uh, we're excited about this knowing these facts because it raises the possibility that we might be able to protect synapses without having the very big task of removing all the amyloid and tau from the brain. Uh, it can make up something on the order of 1% of the weight of the brain, this accumulated amyloid and tau. So how did, I told you we identified this pathway. How did we do that? I'm gonna show you a few slides of uh, some experiments we did here at Yale. So what's shown here are neurons growing in a dish. Whoops. So this is similar to what I showed you before. This is the cell. It makes all these fine processes. And what's shown in this picture here is that misfolded amyloid beta, these are dark because this chemical is sticking to these neurons. And it does so when it's in this misfolded state. And I control the type of A beta that all healthy people have does not stick to the neurons. So we use this binding of the A beta molecule to the nerve cell as a way to identify what might be responsible for that. The way we did that was to take all the genes that are expressed in the brain and then one by one put them into a non-neuronal cell. And we found one gene that when we took it from the nerve cell and put it into a kidney cell, we now got a kidney cell to bind this misfolded A beta. That's what these dark blobs are here. So this is screening through many, many of the genes in brain. We identified this one, which would create a high affinity binding site for the misfolded amyloid to grab onto. <clears throat> And this misfolded binding site seems to be important for synapse loss. So these are some pictures of actual neurons in a dish. Similar to that blue uh, drawing I showed before, this is one of the dendrites. Each of these little blobs here is where it's making a synapse with another cell. And if you take a, a healthy neuron, and then you add a beta to it, you can see where these two arrows are that a couple synapses have been lost. And even in a very short period, five or six hours, you can lose something like 10% of the synapses on this neuron. I'm sorry. 
What's shown at the bottom here, though, is a nerve cell where we've removed the gene for this prion protein. So otherwise, the nerve cell is healthy. It has all of its normal constituents. It makes synapses. But it doesn't have this binding site for amyloid beta, misfolded amyloid beta. And when we expose this neuron to amyloid for five hours, we don't have synapse loss. So at least in a tissue culture dish, this molecule is important uh, for the damage that happens to synapse and their loss. Does this also happen in animals? How can we test that? I'm going to show you some data from mice. How do we induce Alzheimer's disease in a mouse? Well, we can't do it perfectly, uh, but we can generate something that shares similarities with human Alzheimer's disease. And that's by taking these mutations from the, the rare families where one gene causes the disease. Again, that's not 99.5% of Alzheimer's, but rare cases where a single gene causes Alzheimer's. If we take those human genes and put them into the mouse, these mice will start accumulating amyloid beta plaques. This is a different color, but each of these white dots is an amyloid plaque in the brain of a mouse that's expressing these human genes. And then we can test whether these mice have good memory or smart or dumb. And I'll, I'll show you in a second how that's done, but this is just the data. This is a learning task, and I'll show you how this works in a second. Healthy mice, whether they're 12 months old is old for a mouse, three months old is a young adult mouse, healthy mice get faster and faster at this task because they learn uh, the task. So this is normal learning and memory in a mouse. Over here are the mice that have these plaques in their brain. When they're young, before the plaques develop, they can do this task just fine. But as they become older and the amyloid builds up in their brain, they become impaired. They have memory, learning and memory deficits. What does this actually look like? So this is a picture of a healthy mouse. And you're going to see that we watch this mouse swim in a tank of water. So we let it swim. and. What you can't see here, uh, but the mouse had learned, is that there's a hidden platform over here right under the surface of the water. And this mouse had been in the tank 30 times before and had learned, based on the cues around the room, where this hidden platform was. It remembered it and it swam directly there. This is what happens in one of these mice that has the amyloid plaque in its brain. It's been trained just as frequently as that other mouse. And you can see that it's, it's healthy. It can swim OK. It's not uh, paralyzed or sleepy or anything else. And it wants to get to this platform, but it doesn't really know where to go. It eventually gets there. It just couldn't remember where to go. Um, so this is the spatial learning and memory deficit in these Alzheimer's mice. So what happens if we study mice that don't have this amyloid binding site, this prion protein in the brain? So this is a, a schematic of that tank you just saw. This squirrely line is the path of uh, a number of animals when we remove the platform. So healthy animals, wild type, remember where this platform was. In this case, it's in a different place than the movie I showed you. But they remember where this platform was, and they go there. There is no platform, so they can't get out of the water, but they keep swimming back and forth across that location because they know it should be here. They don't spend any time on the other side of the tank. Mice that don't have this protein that I told you about, prion protein, um, basically do the same thing. They can learn the task, remember the location just as well as healthy mice do. These are the transgenic mice. And as I showed you, they're not very good at learning. And if we now test their memory one to three days later, they don't remember where to go. And so they just wander around. 
this is the important group, the fourth group here. These are the mice that have all that amyloid in their brain, but they don't have this neuronal protein, prion protein. So the amyloid, although it's there, it doesn't stick to the synapses. And these mice are, don't lose synapses and they're capable of doing this memory task. So this blocking prion protein then is a potential way to preserve or recover synapses in the brain, even when the Alzheimer's amyloid is present there. And I'm not gonna go into a bunch of detail, but we've developed antibodies that target prion protein and also a small chemical that targets prion protein and has the same effect as this gene deletion. <clears throat> Just before we go on uh, to other chemistry, I wanted to show you one point specifically because this work was supported by the Aging Mind Foundation in particular. As I mentioned, most of Alzheimer's is not genetic. There are many um, risk factors. One of these is damaged head trauma, damage to the, the uh, skull. And we can mimic this in the laboratory and it actually gives us perhaps a little more uh, clinically um, useful assay of Alzheimer's disease dysfunction by mixing the genetic factors we just saw together with an environmental factor. So early on in these mice, if we look at Alzheimer's, the, the mice that are carrying uh, one of these genes, they accumulate a little bit of tau. This uh, bright red staining is abnormal tau accumulation. The difference though is quite similar. Is, there's not much difference from healthy animals. Trauma has a small effect as well, but when you put these two factors together, you get much more tau accumulation in the brain. And if one measures the same memory task that I just showed you a second ago, well, th this is a younger and different mutation than the one I just showed you. So the Alzheimer's alone, the mice do pretty well. Trauma has a little bit of an effect on memory, but the two together have a bigger effect. So we can combine environmental and genetic factors as well, but primarily we've used the genetic only model for Alzheimer's so far. <clears throat> now, uh, just to make a few points about this chemistry, I told you about how we discovered prion protein here at the synapse. Uh, but I also mentioned that we had mapped out a pathway that involved another protein, mgluR5, um, and two intracellular kinases, thin and thick. All four of these proteins here, prion protein, gluR5, thin, and thick, are critical for synapse loss. And this complex is really at the center between amyloid beta, which starts the process, the accumulation of tau, which happens inside of the neuron, and the recruitment of immune mediators to the synapse. And from the sort of drug development point of view, I already alluded to the idea that prion protein might be targeted, uh, but gluR5, thin, and pick, these two other, three other proteins here um, are also potential pharmacology targets. We can target prion protein with an antibody, as I mentioned, and there's other drugs that we've developed that target these. I'm gonna tell you briefly about those. Importantly, when we tested these different drugs and targeting this pathway, um, we used genetic models for Alzheimer's and we waited until the mice were symptomatic. We didn't start treating when they were very young before disease. We waited till they had disease. And by blocking this pathway, synapses could actually be rescued and recovered and learning and memory function could be restored um, after it had been lost. So um, let me say a few words now about one of these 
other molecules that's actually reached into clinical trials. So uh, in this pathway, one of the components is called fin kinase. It's actually um, part of a family of proteins. There's um, eight of them. They're implicated in cancer as well as in Alzheimer's disease. So this, this protein is not unique to neurons. It's in other cells of the body. And uh, proteins that are very similar to fin have other roles in different parts of the body. But there is a drug uh, called AZD530, shown here, that was originally developed by AstraZeneca for cancer because it targeted fin and these related kinases in malignancies. It was generally safe, but it didn't work too well for cancer. But there was a program that made drugs that had been tested already in one indication available for other indications run by the National Institutes of Health. And so we started a program to test this fin kinase inhibitor in Alzheimer's disease. And we could show that if we waited till mice were impaired and we treated with a drug for a month, synapses would come back, even though amyloid was still present in the brain. And the learning and memory of these animals could be recovered. So this is the, the strong transgenic mouse that by 12 months of age is not good at learning. But this same um, strain of mice, if we treat with this fin kinase inhibitor, even though they were impaired at 11 months of age, by one month of treatment at 12 months of age, their ability to learn was equal to healthy mice. So this was certainly very exciting. And this actually then went into the clinic for Alzheimer's disease, and we went into a phase 2A multi-center trial. Um, a limitation, though, is that, as I mentioned, this, these proteins, fin and related molecules, are present in many cells of the body. And if you fully inhibit fin, you have effects on the bone marrow, on the number of blood cells, and it can run risk of uh, gastrointestinal changes and changes in the pulmonary system. So dosing was limited because of these toxicities. And our primary measurement um, to look at synapse density, this FDG PET that I showed you earlier was, did not show a benefit of the drug, although there was benefit on uh, some secondary outcomes. But really the problem here is that there's a very narrow therapeutic window. We can find in mice with exactly the right dose that we get a benefit, but it's very hard to translate this into the clinic because of the uh, symptoms in the elderly, um, the off-target symptoms in the elderly population. We're also very interested in this mGluR5 because uh, this class of uh, protein has been targeted with many drugs for other indications, proteins related to mGluR5. And there are some drugs which have been developed and used for uh, nervous system diseases, in particular Fragile X, that target GluR5. Again, actually they weren't effective for Fragile X, but the drugs have been used in humans and we sought to test these um, in Alzheimer's models. <clears throat> um, and again, we waited until the mice had lost synapses and had memory deficits. We treated with this mGluR5 inhibitor for a month and synapses came back. And the A beta plaque in the brain didn't change. Learning and memory were improved. So again, this is the transgenic model of Alzheimer's. These mice, when they're aged, have an impaired learning ability. But the same mice, this APPPS1 strain that had been treated with this MTAP drug, now can learn just as well as wild type animals. So this is certainly exciting. There is a limitation here though as well. This protein, mGluR5, while it's important for this A-beta signaling that's bad in Alzheimer's disease, 
it has a normal role where it functions to mediate glutamate, a neurotransmitter activity at synapses. So it contributes to normal synaptic function. And that limits the ability to uh, dose completely. Again, there's a narrow therapeutic window. If one completely blocks both the Alzheimer's and the physiologic signaling, um, one actually impairs memory because glutamate is not working. So there's a very fine line here. How do we deal with that? So we've sought to look for drugs that are selective, that will block this Alzheimer's amyloid beta prion protein signaling, so it doesn't happen, and synapses are recovered, without blocking the normal glutamate function of this GluR5. The drug I just showed you is a so-called negative allosteric modulator. I'll just say the most inhibitors of GluR5 block both of these. But we discovered a molecule that blocks only the Alzheimer's signaling and not the normal function. And this is a drug that can be taken as a pill. It's orally available, very potent. It gets into the brain. And uh, the important thing is that because it doesn't block this normal glutamate function, we can actually dose animals at least hundreds of fold greater than the dose that's needed to block the Alzheimer's signal. So we've tested this in the same uh, models that you've seen. Um, these are two memory tasks where the, these gray and blue bars are the Alzheimer's mice. When they've been treated with this drug, they can carry out these two memory tasks the way a healthy animal does. So this is called novel object recognition. Mice prefer new objects, shiny things. Um, and if they're put into a cage with an old and a new object, novel and familiar, they spend more time with the new object. The Alzheimer's mice can't remember that they saw an object the day before, so they actually spend equal time with the two objects. But the aged Alzheimer's mice that have been treated with this silent allosteric modulator drug for a month can now remember that they saw an object on the 27th day and when they're tested on the 28th day, they act just like the blue bars act just like the white bars. This is the swim tank that I showed you a second ago. And uh, on the memory task where they swim around without a target, healthy mice spend at least half their time in the location where the target used to be. The Alzheimer's mice wander around randomly and these mice that have been treated behave very closely to the wild type, the healthy animals in the blue bar. And this is associated with more synapses in the brain. The Alzheimer's mice in the hippocampus have lost about 40% compared to the healthy animals. And then with the drug treatment, this comes back. The synapses, the neurons aren't dead yet in these mice, and synapses can be rebuilt at the rate of about 1% per day if we block this deleterious signaling event. And all of this happens um, without any change in the amount of amyloid that's in the brain. So this drug has now started uh, phase one clinical trials at Yale, and we're very hopeful that we now have a way to attack this uh, pathway with a very broad therapeutic window uh, where we'll be able to get full efficacy um, in clinical trials. So this is the pathway at a synapse that I focused on. And I think the, the major take home uh, that I wanna get to you that's very much separate from other approaches in the Alzheimer's realm is that we're not trying to remove amyloid or tau from the brain, but we're trying to protect the synapses from these toxic molecules. And in discovering these, this pathway, all four of these molecules here, prion protein, GluR5, fin, and PIC, are targets, potential targets for intervention. And in a general sense, 
undercovering, uh, uncovering the biochemistry of the brain is really the way to get at new therapies. This may not be the only approach for Alzheimer's. There may be many out there, but we really need to understand the biochemistry of the brain. And for ourselves, um, this new MGLUR5 drug um, that's just entered clinical trials, we're especially excited about. So I'm gonna uh, stop my talk there, but I, before I do, I wanna um, highlight the people and the agencies that have supported our work, particular Aging Mind Foundation, this lecture, but also some of the work uh, in the laboratory, the Alzheimer's Association, National Institute on Aging, and uh, the Falk Medical Trust. And shown over on the right are people um, here. These are people I've worked with before uh, in my lab, various postdoctoral fellows and graduate students uh, and collaborators in clinical trials. And these are the people who are working on these projects in my laboratory now. So I'll stop there and, and see if there's any questions. Wonderful, thank you so much. What a great talk by him. And we do have a few Q and A's that we wanna do, but for time's sake, we will only do a few. So let's start from the top. One of our attendees asks, is the prion protein at the synapse responsible for destroying the synapse, a prion as in mad cow disease? Right, so <clears throat> in mad cow disease or in the larger term, Creutzfeldt Jakob disease. That's an infectious prion disease. And this pri the prion protein that I was talking about is so-called cellular prion protein. We all have this in the brain. In Creutzfeldt Jakob disease, mad cow disease, that protein misfolds. In the way in Alzheimer's, amyloid misfolds and makes plaques and damages synapses. In um, Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, cellular prion protein misfolds. And once it misfolds, it actually interacts with the host natural form in very much the same way that the misfolded amyloid can interact with cellular prion protein. So um, yes, it's the same protein and the misfolded version of prion protein is acting in a somewhat analogous way to the way misfolded amyloid beta interacts um, in Alzheimer's disease. Maybe I'll just read some of the next ones. Is that uh, appropriate? Either way, uh, with, um, I yeah. can, let me read Lauren's. So okay. while we at Aging Minds Foundation know there is no cure for Alzheimer's, one of our attendees asks, with Biogen's release of Adahelm, can you give a brief overview of how this intravenous infusion can actually slow cognitive decline? <clears throat> so yes, just, just approved yesterday, as I'm sure many of you know by the FDA. That's an antibody which binds to amyloid beta. And by infusing this antibody into the bloodstream, some of it gets into the brain, it binds to amyloid beta in the brain and definitely reduces some of the plaque in the brain. So as I started the whole talk, amyloid beta is triggering this damage to synapses. This uh, antibody is designed to reduce the amount of amyloid beta and therefore less of the driving force for this process. Wonderful. Uh, and then we I see, have, and, yep, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I was just gonna read what next I see. Can AZD530 be quote unquote injected directly into the brain? AZD, unlike an antibody like the um, Biogen antibody, that's a large molecule floats around in the bloodstream. Of course, we all have antibodies. AZD is a small molecular weight drug that's synthesized in a chemistry lab and it crosses the blood-brain barrier, um, well, much better than an antibody does. So some of it gets into the brain directly. That's also true for the mGluR5 drug that I told you about 
it actually prefers the brain over the blood. So if you take a pill, it's absorbed in, by the gut, gets into the blood, it crosses very well into the brain. I see. And we have uh, time for one more question and then we will wrap it up. Okay, I see. It says clarification. Do you need the proteins like prion and glur 5 for synapses to work? Or is too much, or there is too much and it decreases synapses? You want these proteins or you don't want these proteins? Um, what are you blocking? Okay, so cellular prion protein is normally at synapses. But if you remove it completely, for example, as we did in these knockout mice, synapses can still work. So it's there and its function, so far as we know, is really only negative. In Alzheimer's, prion protein is already there. We don't really know why it's there in an evolutionary sense. Um, it's there. And when amyloid becomes misfolded, it interacts with prion protein is does something bad. So completely getting rid of prion protein is good. For GLUR5, um, it has an important normal function at the synapse as a receptor for glutamate, a neurotransmitter. And completely removing GLUR5 is a bad thing. Synapses, although they're still there, they don't work right. So for GLUR5, the approach is different. We want to selectively block the amyloid prion protein activation of GLUR5, but we don't want to remove GLUR5 completely or block its activity completely. Okay. Wonderful. And now we're going to play a brief video from AMF. Dementia is a progressive brain disease that slowly and relentlessly steals a person's memory and ultimately their identity and ability to function. Alzheimer's disease is the most common form of dementia and despite its general public image, it affects more than just the elderly. It also greatly impacts their caregivers and loved ones and is the costliest disease in the country. With 6 million Americans living with Alzheimer's, the estimated cost is $355 billion per year. And as our growing population ages, cases and costs are expected to triple by 2050. It's also increasingly impacting a younger demographic as early onset Alzheimer's, diagnosed between 30 to 65 years of age, becomes more common. Dementia is a horrific and cruel disease that steals your memories, your ability to function, and erases a life lived. One in every three seniors dies with Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia, and two out of three people diagnosed are women. Will you be one of those statistics? Will your partner? Your children? In the United States' top 10 most deadly diseases, Alzheimer's is the only one that cannot be prevented, treated, or cured. And while deaths from diseases like HIV, heart disease, and cancer have steadily declined, deaths from Alzheimer's have increased. It's time that Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia begin to get the funding and attention they deserve. It's time we change the course of Alzheimer's disease. Since 2014, Aging Mind Foundation has been continually committed to raising funds for vital brain research. We're focused on funding research that seeks the cause of Alzheimer's disease and other types of dementia because we must understand the root cause in order to develop treatments and prevention. Partner with us, join us, donate. Help fund the necessary brain research that will alter the course of Alzheimer's and dementia so future generations will not have to suffer the harsh realities and cruelty of losing loved ones to this disease. Let's make Alzheimer's the only memory we forget. All right, wonderful. I wanna take a moment just to say thank you again, Dr. Strip Matter. Thank you, that presentation was very insightful. And also thank you for everyone who attended. Um, we're going to have these webinars every month. So tune in next month, July 6th. It's a Tuesday and it's going to be at 11 a.m. for another talk. Thank you again. Thank you.